gospel lesson this morning is Luke 15, 11 through 32. Now this is quite a long story, so just follow along. And I didn't break it up because it is one story. It's a very familiar and classic story of the prodigal son. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who had sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder brother was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fat calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your commandment, yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, it's, when, but when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Word of the Lord. The path of discovering God's mercy can seem very strange to us, and for several reasons. The first reason is this. Discovering God's mercy does not really begin with you or with me or with us. It begins with God. God shows mercy long before we're even aware of the possibility or the need. God is very proactive. Now mercy involves compassion and leniency and kindness and tolerance and is given freely by someone who is in authority who has the power to punish or to harm but does not. Now Jesus was preparing to speak to a group of tax collectors and sinners. Now, there were some Pharisees and scribes who were around, and they were seeing what was going on, and they began to grumble. He, he's eating with these undesirables. They said, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
he was breaking the rules because he was supposed to remain pure and separated. They were outcasts. Well, these Pharisees and scribes did have real power to punish. They could be merciful or they could be cruel. But they were not merciful. So Jesus explained his behavior to the scribes and Pharisees by telling them three stories. The last story he told is the one that I have just read to you about the prodigal son. By the way, the word prodigal simply means lavish spending and that kind of raucous behavior. So, what was the first story? Well, the first story was this. It was about a shepherd who temporarily left his flock to go find a sheep that had become lost in the wilderness. And then upon finding the sheep, the shepherd brings it home and calls together everyone to have a party, to celebrate and rejoice over the return of that lost sheep. <clears throat> then Jesus makes the point. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents over than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So he goes on to elaborate. The tax collectors and the sinners, they're lost sheep. And I'm going to search for them to bring them home. And how am I going to do that without being with them? And being with them in gracious ways that allow them to really listen to what I have to say rather than becoming defensive. You know, if you do that, you're risking your reputation. Well, then he tells them a second story. It's about a woman who had ten coins. And she lost one of them in her house. Immediately she lights the candle and gets the broom and sweeps that house thoroughly until she finds that coin. And then what does she do? She calls everybody together, friends and neighbors and family. Let's have a party and celebrate. And again, Jesus makes the point. Just so I tell you. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus is searching for the lost coin among the tax collectors and Pharisees. And sometimes we can feel like that tax collector or that, that sinner. We can be that lost sheep. We can be that lost coin. And it's good to know that God takes the initiative to come find us, not to punish us, but to bring us home, back into God's kingdom, back into repentance, back into a positive, reconciled relationship with God. Well, third, Jesus tells the Pharisees the story of the prodigal son. But there's something different about this story besides its length. It tells us something about the second part of the strangeness of discovering God's grace. Now, uh, the first two stories focus on the one showing mercy. You know, the, the shepherd, the woman. In the third story, the father shows mercy like the shepherd and the woman. But the one who is lost is a person, not a sheep or a coin. So the second part of the strangeness to discovering God's mercy is that even a person cannot envision God's mercy for their life. Genuine mercy of God remains hidden. And it can only be revealed as a surprise. 
Now the son squandered the father's inheritance and finds himself in a desperate situation. And finally, in order to save himself, he figures out a plan. And this was the best he could do. He'll, re he'll return home, confess his sin, and ask to be able to live like a servant. Well, it was beyond him to consider the possibility that his father could rejoice over his return when by all rights the father could have disowned him. He had broken all the rules, all the cultural rules, all the family rules, and he could have been disowned and rejected. And he just could not envision his father rejoicing over his return and treating him like a son again and throwing a party. And, you know, we live sometimes in guilt, sometimes in fear, sometimes in shame, or sometimes in mistrust, and we get ourselves in a mess. And it is hard for us to envision that great expansiveness of God's mercy also, like the prodigal son. And so it comes to us as a great surprise. Don't you think he got the shock of his life when his father reacted like he did? We expect punishment. We get mercy. But what about the older brother? You know, it's always, I'm sure preachers finally bring in the older brother. You know, it's sort of like an afterthought or a footnote. Now, but the older brother shows the third part of the strangeness of discovering God's mercy. And that third part is that it is as much of a surprise to the good righteous people as it is to the sinner who's in a big mess. And the, the older son becomes jealous of his brother now. It's just not fair. So the father has to explain to him. But we had to rejoice and celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and now he is found. You know, this older brother teaches us something important about justice as well as mercy. You know, justice can be like the Pharisees wanting punishment. The older brother in his jealousy, he wanted justice. It's just not fair to me that you're treating him that way after all he has done. So there's the Pharisaic way of conceiving of justice. But the Christ-like way of conceiving of justice is that our justice and our doing what's right and our sense of fairness has to be tempered with mercy. Even though, yeah, by all rights, there could be punishment. There also needs to be mercy. And there's not a one of us who will not be grateful for that loving, compassionate mercy. And so may we, the church, as we continue on our own paths of discovering God's mercy, may we actually try to do our best as a church to be like the shepherd, be like the woman, and be like the father who showed mercy and upended everyone's expectations.